Good evening and thanks for joining us on a special edition of CBS News Detroit at 7 o'clock. I'm Jeff Skaversky. And I'm Amir Makeupson. Tonight we're taking a closer look at how Detroit police solve homicide cases and why so many of those cases remain unresolved right here at home and across the country. Tonight we're joined by Todd Flood, managing partner of Flood Law and former assistant Wayne County prosecutor. We're also joined by Steve Dolant, former assistant chief in the Detroit Police Department. Gentlemen, we welcome you tonight. Thank you for joining us. It's great to have you. We're going to have obviously an hour long discussion as we get into all sorts of topics around this issue. But great before we do, we want everybody to understand what we're talking about. So before we begin, there are some key terms and statistics that we're going to cover tonight. And so let's start with clearance rates. Clearance rates are measured when a homicide case has been solved and arrests have been made. Nationwide, the clearance rate reached a 50-year low in the U.S. That's according to the FBI, while homicide clearance rates fell to just over 50% in 2020. But unlike the rest of the country, Detroit has seen a rise. According to the FBI, Detroit's clearance rates rose to between 60 and 90%. So, Steve, let's start with you. Why is the national average going down and so low, yet Detroit remains high and continues to rise. I think it's how you do it. Um, used to be in Detroit, clearance rate is when I caught the bad guy, when we caught the bad guy, but the actual clearance rate is when we catch and convict him. That's the clearance rate. That's how you close the case. So it could be the way that different uh, cities are closing their cases. But I think the technology in Detroit has improved so much. When I was at Homicide, we were getting 500 homicides a year. It's ridiculous. Uh, one and a half a day. 300 is still too many. There's, we've gone so far in Detroit as far as the technology. I think we've surpassed some other cities that way. Do you think in some ways, though, that um, are we almost too reliant on technology? At times, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no doubt about that. You can ping a phone. You can look at video. Uh, but the bottom line is you have to go out, talk to people, gain their confidence, get rid of the no-snitch policy and have people say, yes, that's who did it, and not be afraid to testify. So a lot of it's the old, quote, unquote, gumshoe stuff, but the technology is another tool in the belt to help you solve it. Let, let's bring Todd in. Todd, I'm going to ask you the same thing here. Sure. In your opinion, from what you do and what you've done for a living, why do you think things continue to rise here in Detroit while the rest of the country is going down? Regarding solving the cases, really it's kind of simple. We're, there's no playbook for the pandemic. Right. And having police officers right now with all the technology, the law enforcement person that approves the warrant is the prosecutor. When I was a prosecutor, we worked the same amount of hours that the new prosecutors do, but they have now to go through all the body cams, go through all the technology, and they want to get it right. I think Kim Worthy is trying to make sure that every person that's charged, right, is the right person that's charged, don't want to get the wrong person. And so that's why we put and implemented around the country body cams, uh, you know, audio cams within the, in the cars. So going through that, a prosecutor working hard, diligently, but there's limited resources. Imagine you have 300 homicides come into the prosecutor of the day, the pod, and um, uh, let's say you get 10 on a weekend. Can you imagine being one person, one prosecutor, having to go through all of those homicides, review all the audio, review all of the body cams? It takes a long time. You think with the technology, it would be easier. But you're saying in a, in a strange way, it's harder just because there's so much more data, so much more information to go through. Got to get it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you want to go through it. So it's best for the citizens. It's best for everybody involved. All right, well, we're going to dive much deeper into this. When we come back, we're going to also talk more about some of the other homicide cases and what's taking so long. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Macomb County. Hi, we're CBS News Detroit. But we don't just cover the news here. We're also here, here, and everywhere in between. You know, the places you live, work, and play in Southeast Michigan. We're talking less of this. And more of the stories that actually matter to you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock.
That's right, local news just found a home in your neighborhood. We're CBS News Detroit, live, streaming, and on demand. Nice to meet you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Wayne County. around the clock in Monroe County. CBS News Detroit, the stories you care about. Live, streaming, and on demand. We're on your block, around the clock. Southeast Michigan News, whenever you want it. We live here, we work here. From North Branch to Southgate. East Point to Westland. Wherever you live, we're here for you. Making a difference in your neighborhood. CBS News Detroit, live, streaming, and on demand. Building a better newscast, one story at a time. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Oakland County. Are you ready? How would you build the newscast of the future? Expect the unexpected. CBS News Detroit. CBS News Detroit. Southeast Michigan News whenever you want it. We're ready to go live from your community. Anywhere, anytime. Live streaming and on demand. If that's the name of the game. We are ready. CBS News Detroit in your neighborhood. Live, streaming, and on demand. Welcome back tonight. We'll introduce you to four different stories about crime without punishment and why so many homicide cases remain unsolved here at home and across the country. We'll be watching these stories in real time along with you and break down them with our guests tonight. We're joined by Todd Flood, managing partner of Flood Law and former assistant chief in Detroit Police Department, Steve Dolan. Back in June, CBS news stations across the country anticipated in a series called Crime Without Punishment, a project geared toward analyzing the decline in homicide arrests nationwide. We sat down with Michael McGinnis, Detroit Police Commander of these major crimes divisions, along with Detroit Police Chief James White to find out why so many of these crimes go unsolved. What keeps you up at night? Unfortunately, there's cases that we're not able to close and they're still open and, and, and those haunt me. The next thing I know, I see my son laying on Tuller, on the ground, shot in his throat and in his chest. To me, I felt that was overkill. I feel every pain every time somebody loses someone, and I see that mother on TV, and she's crying her heart out. Anytime we lose a member of our community, uh, it's tragic. Oftentimes, uh, there's no real reason that these things are happening. What it takes to close a homicide case today is very different than what it was even 10 years ago. Every well law enforcement agency wants to make, wants to clear as many homicides as possible. The clearance rate is just simply the percentage of reported homicides that arrests have been made. Since the pandemic, we've, we've suffered some setbacks in our closure rate, but prior to that, we were able to maintain a, in the 50 or 60 range. So in 2016, Detroit had 302 homicides and only 45 cases led to an arrest. We had 300 in 2016? We had 302 homicides. Okay. And only 45 of those led to an arrest. That's not accurate. I'm no? I'm not sure where you got that, no. It'd be about 130. 135, somewhere, somewhere in there. Where did you get that from? I know that some of it was from FBI. If that does come from the FBI, I can tell you that our, our system for communicating statistics with the FBI 
uh, prior to 2016 was not ideal. You know, policing right now um, it, it needs to re-image and rebrand, uh, and that starts with community transparency. When a homicide occurs, one of the first things outside of processing the homicide scene is that, all, is that investigators do what's called a neighborhood canvas. We've established trust with the community, and when you do that, they are willing to help you. And when they're willing to help you, you're able to close cases. My community knows who did this. And they know who I'm talking to. They know, but they still not gonna say anything to me. Some of these cases are multi-layered, involve multiple people, and you know, you just need cooperation at every level to get that answer, to get those answers. We're fortunate here in Detroit that we have we have a lot of technology that we're able to leverage to help us close cases. I feel, do feel his case should have been done better than what it was. I feel that they have other resources of finding out things, you know, uh, what happens, you know, in different cases and this, that, and the other. There's also cases that are just a, a uh, you know, we just have no leads and no clues, and you've you've done your video canvas and you've knocked on every door and you've you know got the phone records and there's just nothing. The volume and the and the number of cases that they carry, you know, we've got to get them uh, some help, and that help comes through recruiting. It's just so much more information that we have to sift through now than what we did, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Well, we need, we need violent crime to be reduced. That's, the, that's the, the single best cure for our closure rate. All I know is that I need, I needed the help. I don't feel that he should have been a statistic. Our detectives, they, be, they become so engaged with the family that they, they bear the burden of the grief that they're suffering. They never heal from it. It's like a void. I try not to show my hurt on the outside, but I hurt in the inside. Oh, I just kind of wish that the, our community was a lot better than what it is. I wish it wasn't a lot of killings, murders, as they want to say. I wish it was more unity. And I wish it was more understanding and less judgment, but these are the things I wish for. Still have. Well, we were just talking a little bit more about this, and um, Commander McGinnis, he said in there that the to solve a homicide case right now is very different than how it was 10 years ago, but I'm almost wondering, uh, Steve, if, are we, do we think it's easier than it is in watching television shows and reality TV that you go in, you pull up a tennis shoe database and then, oh, there's my footprint? Yeah, that's TV. Yeah. Uh, and they also put him in jail within an hour. Uh, it's amazing. This is what they do on TV. No, no, no. Because if you get a paint chip, say, from an accident, then you got to get it analyzed. DNA doesn't come back like that, unlike it does on TV. Fingerprints don't come back right away. Uh, when you do a six pack, uh, the photo lineup, it's changed. It used to be you get the six photographs, now they're doing it on a computer screen. The technology has changed, and it's great, but the TV thing, no. That, that, yeah, no. but do you think that sometimes for people in the community that that's how they really think it is? So oh. that's what they expect of you all. Oh, absolutely. Um, they did it on Blue Bloods in an hour. Why can't you? Yeah. And then they, what is it, Law and Order? They got them convicted. And if it's a two-part series, in two hours. Yeah. We can't do that. And um, I, I do like some of the shows where it explains how the judge is saying, no, you can't use that, no, you can't that, because a lot of systems don't understand that. The one uh, woman was saying, there's more we could do. There's other things people, the cops could do. But you have to do it legally. And, and Todd knows that. He's a defense attorney. Right. Yep. And we bring in Todd, and you were speaking during the video there that there's an institutional issue with Detroit police. Can you expand on that? 
The institutional knowledge back in the day, I mean, we had real training going on and we had senior detectives that were training all the way down the line. Uh, no one got in the job of public service to become wealthy. You got in the job of public service to devote yourself to the citizens. Here, you see the prosecutor's office, the institutional knowledge has dwindled. Um, don't get me wrong, there's great ones. Uh, I'm involved in a case right now with one of the best detectives in Detroit, Todd Eby. I mean, there's great detectives in Detroit, but they're dwindled, right? And we need training and we need resources. Uh, Judge Worthy hits it nail on the head. If we had more money, more prosecutors, more boots on the ground, there would be a bigger deterrent for crime, right? Because one of the things is, is to ferret out the bad guy. And speed, we just talked about speed. You, you get a DNA sample and it can take up to a year. Imagine that, up to a year to get back. Uh, you get anything that has to go through the Michigan State Lab and you fall in line with all the other cases. There's thousands of warrants today if you walked into the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office sitting on a desk. And it's not because they're lazy, it's because they're doing everything they can to keep up, one, with watching all the technology, watching all the videos, all those things, and two, uh, they don't have the resources to make it happen fast enough. They can't call up the Michigan State Police and say, give me that DNA, as we just talked about, mm -hmm. in a matter of a minute. So, so let me ask you both of you, really, when you speak upon those lines and there's a portion of the country and even some politicians who believe, hey, maybe we should defund the police, mm. how much more problematic is that? <laughs> That's uh, off the chart crazy. If you defunded the police, you would see it even worse. Yeah. The, the victims' families would be in more peril and more traumatized because there would never be any hope right and your solution of solving crimes and making a deterrent in our street would be harsher so um, that I think is a non-starter law enforcement needs to be here and we need to be able to have it so that there's integrity and transparency can we clarify though for some people what exactly do we mean when we say defund the police some people think that means you're stripping police departments right. of all money and it, it but it's not exactly that no I, I think the, the key, there is probably this misnomer with regards to defunding the police. One faction will say we want to educate the police. We want to have re, uh, tooling on how we handle crime and, and make it so there's not force issues. Uh, another side of defunding the police, even further out there, is actually diminishing their role in policing authority and getting more into educational issues with the community at large. Um, neither, uh, there's a solution here, the solution is bigger than us, but ultimately at the end, we need to have safe streets. We need to be able to have children be able to walk down a street without going through an abandoned house and having a crime or a homicide or a rape take place. The only way we get that is, and you heard it through the officers, good ones, we need to have trust with the community, we need to have the ability to talk with the community, and we need to be able to make safe neighbor neighborhoods for everyone to enjoy education and enjoy our streets. How do you do that? I think there's an ability to make it so you do it right the first way with the right amount of resources. Yeah. Enlightening conversation. This will continue when we come right back. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock, in Macomb County. Hi, we're CBS News Detroit, but we don't just cover the news here. We're also here, here, and everywhere in between. You know, the places you live, work, and play in Southeast Michigan. We're talking less of this, and more of the stories that actually matter to you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock. That's right, local news just found a home in your neighborhood. We're CBS News Detroit, live, streaming, and on demand. Nice to meet you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Wayne County.
CBS News Detroit on your block around the clock in Monroe County. CBS News Detroit, the stories you care about. Live, streaming, and on demand. We're on your block around the clock. Southeast Michigan News whenever you want it. We live here. We work here. From North Branch to Southgate. East Point to Westland. Wherever you live, we're here for you. Making a difference in your neighborhood. CBS News Detroit. Live, streaming, and on demand. Building a better newscast, one story at a time. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Oakland County. Are you ready? How would you build the newscast of the future? Expect the unexpected. CBS News Detroit. CBS News Detroit. Southeast Michigan News whenever you want it. We're ready to go live from your community. Anywhere, anytime. Live streaming and on demand. If that's the name of the game, we are ready. CBS News Detroit, in your neighborhood. Live, streaming, and on demand. Welcome back. We are taking you now to Jackson, Mississippi, which has one of the highest per capita homicide rates in the country. CBS News Chief Investigative Correspondent Jim Axelrod reports on the impact these homicides have on family members and the troubling racial disparity in which cases get solved. Everyone in this room who has had a member of their family murdered, raise your hand. When we started calling mothers who'd lost their children to murder in Jackson, Mississippi, word got around and more than 30 people arrived for our interview. They didn't investigate my case. And more just kept coming. Margie Allen, Danita Williams, and Lucinda Wade Robinson all lost sons to gun violence in Jackson. Has there been any arrest made in either of these three cases? No. no. Mm -mm. Not one arrest. I was showed a picture of my baby on the side of the road. I was showed some information, and I was told to go solve my own crime. Go solve your own crime? And bring them the evidence, and I would take it to them. In Jackson, the capital of Mississippi, the numbers are stunning. 156 homicides last year, one of the highest per capita homicide rates in the entire country. The whole system is backlog. Jackson Police Department Chief James Davis is talking about the state crime lab. I can use more police officers. I can use more homicide detectives. But if the state is backed up, the court is backed up. I don't think any police department in the nation can say that they got enough resources. The mothers repeatedly expressed frustration with the response they got from Jackson homicide detectives. Let me be honest with you, when your loved one is killed, you can never do enough to solve that case. And remember, if this was your child, you want immediate answers too. The Jackson Police Department told us it makes arrests in six out of 10 homicide cases above the national average. I get the feeling no matter how often you talk about it, the tears don't stop. No, mm -hmm. no. You just lay in bed no. at night I and do. just cry all night and you get up and try to mm -hmm. fight more to get justice for your child. Mm -hmm. It's too much. Three weeks after our visit to Jackson, police announced arrests in the case of Margie Allen's son's murder, a year and a half after his death. Jim Axelrod, CBS News, Jackson, Mississippi. In a Forbes article last year, Detroit ranked third most dangerous cities in the U.S., the first highest behind St. Louis and Jackson, Mississippi, where that story is based out of. So for both of you, in your opinions, what is the solution here as we see that there's just not enough police and there's too much information and there's too many crimes? What's the solution here? I think it starts in the neighborhoods. We have to change um, the whole dynamic in the cities. Uh, these are young men that are getting killed. These aren't older people. These aren't, most of them aren't innocent victims, unfortunately. A lot of them are in gangs and stuff. We have to get them jobs. We have to get them an education and get them to trust the police and, and, and trust each other. And the neighborhood has to trust us. And we have to build that trust. Unfortunately, like what happened in Memphis the other day, people aren't trusting us right now. They're not. And can you, I mean, can you No, I don't blame no, them at right. all. I mean. It's not the first time, it won't be the last time. 
And we have to build that trust. And unfortunately, a few bad actors, and it's a few, because I am a firm believer that almost 90 plus percent of the police are good. Maybe they're not cops, they're police officers. They do what they have to do when the cops go out there and, and, and do the real work. But come on, do I blame anyone for not liking me now? No. Why should you? Why should you trust me after that? Criminally, they committed. They were criminal. They are criminals. I'm sorry. Yeah. They, they're criminals. And you can say what you want. And there's you're a defense attorney. Maybe not all of them <laughs> will get sec. No, they're not all going to get second degree murder. They're all going to have different uh, levels of culpability. But they committed a crime and they let it happen. And those guys, it was filmed. It was, but you know, crimes like that, especially once they hit the airwaves and become big in the media, it does at least appear that they get resolved a lot quicker than you know some of the parents that we saw. But you alluded to it before that not all crimes are created equal when it oh, comes no, to no, no, no. Yeah. We were he was talking with the lab. I think we said the lab when our when Todd said, "Oh, the lab was backed up." Yeah, because back in the day, the homicide unfortunately was ranked higher than the criminal sexual assault, which we have now found that they're equal because that's what happens. Todd, when you're dealing with a family and representing a family, a father, a mother, a, sure. a wife, a husband, and they're going through something like this and they can't get things resolved, they can't get peace and closure, how do you also manage that on top of really just trying to get justice? I don't think there is justice. There might be some mercy. Right, you might find the bad guy, but I call it the Valley of Tears. Um, so justice, as far as I'm concerned, finding the bad guy and having that person prosecuted, um, that when it doesn't happen, and uh, you can't get closure in that chapter for a victim's family, um, it's insanely difficult. And I don't know how you heal with that. How would any of us heal with mm -hmm. that? Um, I think we're hitting on two issues. You're hitting on the police issue, and you're hitting on how do we make this better. East Lake, back in your town where you lived once in Georgia, East Lake had the highest crime rate around for rape, assaults, and the like. Now it's the lowest. What did they do to change the community? They changed the community by getting education, by getting uh, uh, better homes, better, better police force. So. Ultimately, those core values, I think, if you bring them in, you ultimately will lower cases. The other big problem here, and you heard it on the story, we're in a major backlog in our courtrooms. I, across uh, the country. Across the and country. And pandemic related? Oh, pandemic related, and, and on top of it, um, criminals, recidivism, they didn't get busted the first time. The warrant's still sitting there, so they go out and do it again, yeah. right? And so attorneys, both prosecution and defense and police officers are tired. And we're being forced right now uh, to do the best we possibly can to get cases through the system. Judges are working with us, but at the end of the day of all of that, how do you get to the end? If we're four or five years behind, if we were actually doing cases on a normal, regular basis, we would be up to snuff. But right now, you got police officers that are overworked. Mm -hmm. You got institutional knowledge that's down that you can't teach. You're learning on the job. Uh, you got labs that are jammed packed with DNA and everything else you can possibly think of. And you got a short staff of prosecutors that have to watch 50 films before they can make one charge, right? Mm -hmm. That's a difficult gig. It's hard. Uh, so I don't know the solution all, but at the end of the day, one thing I do know, if we're going to throw money into infrastructure, we should throw money into this infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We should make sure police are equally armed as the defense and the like. Well, we do have some hurdles ahead. This conversation is going to continue. Still ahead, we'll show you how a rise in pending Wayne County court cases are keeping people waiting for answers. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock, in Macomb County. Hi, we're CBS News Detroit. But we don't just cover the news here. We're also here, here, and everywhere in between. You know, the places you live, work, and play in Southeast Michigan. 
We're talking less of this and more of the stories that actually matter to you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock. That's right, local news just found a home in your neighborhood. We're CBS News Detroit, live, streaming, and on demand. Nice to meet you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Wayne County. Detroit on your block around the clock in Monroe County. CBS News Detroit, the stories you care about. Live, streaming, and on demand. We're on your block around the clock. Southeast Michigan News whenever you want it. We live here. We work here. From North Branch to Southgate. East Point to Westland. Wherever you live, we're here for you. Making a difference in your neighborhood. CBS News Detroit live streaming and on demand building a better newscast one story at a time cbs news detroit on your block around the clock in oakland county Are you ready? how would you build the newscast of the future expect the unexpected cbs news detroit cbs news detroit southeast michigan news whenever you want it we're ready to go live from your community Anywhere, anytime. Live streaming and on demand. If that's the name of the game, we are ready. CBS News Detroit, in your neighborhood. Live streaming and on demand. Well, we have been talking about it. Criminal cases in Wayne County continue to pile up, and now thousands of lives are on hold for months or even years while families are waiting for those cases to be resolved. Our Ray Strickland has an in-depth look at how these delays are impacting the accused, the victims, and their loved ones. I've been crying for two years. I've been crying for two years. Nobody hear me. The emotional toll of fighting two cases in Wayne County has been unbearable for Maddie Jones. I'm just tired. I'm tired of this. I just want my life back. I just want my life back. A never-ending saga for the 60-year-old who is facing assault and weapons charges. They stem from disputes with their neighbor back in 2020 and 2021. Jones says she was attacked and used her gun in self-defense. They beat me in that street, and it was totally wrong. Jones and her attorney, Darnell Barton, say it's been a battle to prove her innocence for nearly two years. It's because her case continues to be delayed due to a backlog in Wayne County. Meanwhile, she's forced to wear this tether while she waits for her trial to begin in March of next year. My original life is in Alabama. I have one daughter, 45 years old, and two granddaughters. I haven't seen my children just do all of this. I got great grands. I ain't seen two of them since I did because I can't go home. Maddie Jones' story is what so many others are experiencing. Thousands of cases just like Jones are being delayed due to a backlog in Wayne County. It's a problem that was made worse during the pandemic in 2020 when courts like this one shut down. So with no judge or jury able to hear any cases, defendants, victims, and their loved ones have been forced to wait months or even years to go to trial. This is not something that is going to be taken care of overnight as much as we'd like it to be. According to the state, before the pandemic, Wayne County Third Circuit Court averaged around 400 jury trials. In 2018, for instance, there were 423 jury verdicts. But in 2021, that number dropped to 33. That led to what some are now calling a crisis, where pending criminal cases went from 2,084 in 2018 to 6,349 in 2021. We must have some kind of common ground, or else we are going to be trying cases until 2027, at least, 
with this backlog. Lillian Diallo is a defense attorney based in Detroit. She says lawyers are working around the clock juggling more cases than they ever have in their careers. You have no weekends. You have no nightlife. You have no family time. But Diallo says her workload pales in comparison to the weight the accused, victims, and their families carry while they wait for the case to move through the courts. Some people, like Maddie Jones, are fortunate enough to receive a personal bond, but others are still sitting in jail until their case is resolved. Diallo believes it's forcing innocent people to take plea deals. They say, I'll just take it. I just want to go home to my family. I want to, you know, try to get my job. This is an un unprecedented circumstance. Timothy Kinney is the chief judge for Third Circuit Court. He says typically the criminal division sees around 1,500 pending felony cases. He says that number is now at 4,400. We are particularly concerned about the uh, defendants who are in the Wayne County Jail. Uh, right now and those who have been in there for a considerable period of time. Kinney says the Third Circuit Court is looking at revamping how it does staffing in the criminal division so that more judges can be scheduled to do trials. It was not the norm here for people to be waiting for years and years for their cases to be tried. That just didn't happen here. Wayne County oh, Prosecutor man. Kim Worthy's office tries more cases than any other county in Michigan. In fact, more than all 82 others combined. She says the caseload is overwhelming her department, which like much of the country is dealing with a shortage of workers. We have uh, lawyers who are dealing with caseloads of 50 homicides apiece, 50 sexual assault homicides, um, 50 sexual assault cases apiece. 300 DV, domestic violence cases apiece, and so it's led to really, really quite inhumane caseload. Worthy says she's trying to bring on more prosecutors to help with the backlog, but she's also calling on the state for more funding. But she says her priority right now is to get these cases moving for the sake of not only the accused, but for the victims as well. Prosecutors have Kind of a dual responsibility of making sure each defendant, each and every defendant has due process, but nobody ever wants to talk about the victims. And it's it's very unfortunate. When victims of crime at the end of the day have to go home and live with what, what has happened to them for the rest of their lives. Yeah, I am an old lady, old walker with a damn tailor. For Jones, she says what's happening in Wayne County is not fair and wrong, and she's looking forward to the day when this will all be over. It'll release everything that I'm going through. I feel like a person again. I feel human again. In Detroit, I'm Ray Strickland. So, Todd, as we see there, Maddie Jones has the tether on her ankle there. Right. And, okay, let's assume for a second that she is innocent. Well, she's presumed innocent. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, sure, 100%. Yeah. Right. If the system is so backed up, how unfair is it that someone like that has to sit there with the tether on her ankle, um, whether it's house arrest, somebody's dealing with house arrest, or whatever they're dealing with, how unfair is that? Well, it's called a violation of your due process rights. We have a constitution, and it's that Sixth Amendment. But it also opens up Pandora's box, sure right? Sure does, sure does. And what's the solution? Um, she's not in, she is on a tether, and uh, there is a right for the people. There is a right for the state, just as much as there is a right for her to have due process. The violation of this, uh, again, I started off with saying there's no playbook here, right? There is no playbook for this situation. Uh, to the extent that the attorney needs to make a motion to say, judge, this is an unusual and cruel punishment. She isn't going anywhere. She's out on bond. The fact that she has a tether, where is she going, right? She's always appeared and the like. So the court needs to take looks at bonds uh, and tethers uh, to make sure that they do everything possible. But we have good cause. There's good cause not to be able to have the trial right now because you have people in custody that need to get in the courtroom and have trial. So you fall down the line as it goes, and the court's gonna do that balancing act. The bigger question is, what's gonna be the evidence? What happens if the government's, uh, you know, what happens if the evidence gets lost? Or what happens if it becomes stale? What happens if witnesses die? What happens if, next thing you know, you don't have your key witness that's supposed to testify for you? Those things are very troubling to me.
right? And for prosecutors and defense attorneys alike. So it's not going to be, uh, Judge Worthy's right. I think, you know, as you keep on examining, pull back the layers of the onion, she said something here. Domestic violence cases pick up a huge portion of the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office, a major portion. The cities within our, you know, around Detroit and Detroit have ordinances. We need to start passing those cases off to city prosecutors, to the local law enforcement agent and the city prosecutor to kind of make the Wayne County prosecutors have some freedom here to focus in on the homicides, focus in on those big felonies. Mm -hmm. It almost seems unrealistic to think if cases can drag on for years that your witnesses will be able to remember all those little details of where yeah. were you on this day and yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, exactly. That creates Sorry. a different problem. They're not going to remember it or they may change their stories or they remember something different, if especially a senior citizen or someone who's been assaulted. Now, that was a person who's on a tether. So say they get her off the tether right away, what if you're the victim? Like, wait a minute, what about my rights? I have a right to go to testify against her. So it's a catch-22. It, yeah. It's catch-22. Yeah. All right, up next we will have and introduce you to a former Detroit police officer who tells us how civil unrest in her new community broke trust between officers and those who call it home. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Macomb County. Hi, we're CBS News Detroit. But we don't just cover the news here. We're also here, here, and everywhere in between. You know, the places you live, work, and play in Southeast Michigan. We're talking less of this. And more of the stories that actually matter to you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock. That's right, local news just found a home in your neighborhood. We're CBS News Detroit, live, streaming, and on demand. Nice to meet you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Wayne County. Detroit on your block around the clock in Monroe County. CBS News Detroit, the stories you care about. Live, streaming, and on demand. We're on your block around the clock. Southeast Michigan News whenever you want it. We live here. We work here. From North Branch to Southgate. East Point to Westland. Wherever you live, we're here for you. Making a difference in your neighborhood. CBS News Detroit live streaming and on demand building a better newscast one story at a time cbs news detroit on your block around the clock in oakland county Are you ready? how would you build the newscast of the future expect the unexpected cbs news detroit cbs news detroit southeast michigan news whenever you want it we're ready to go live from your community anywhere, anytime. Live streaming and on demand. If that's the name of the game, we are ready. CBS News Detroit, in your neighborhood. Live streaming and on demand. Welcome back. Since the start of the pandemic, homicide rates in the U.S. have soared. A CBS News investigation finds there's a 50-50 chance a murder suspect will not be arrested. And that rate gets worse in cases with victims of color. Once again, here's CBS News Chief Investigative Correspondent Jim Axelrod. I grew up without a father who was killed in the line of duty, and his murder is still unsolved to this day. Renee Hall became a Detroit police officer herself when she was 28. And my goal is to make sure that no one else has to live through that same level of trauma. These sessions are about how we 
do better. 18 years later, she was appointed chief of police in Dallas. Hall told us that the pandemic you need to leave the parking garage now. and then the civil unrest that followed the murder of George Floyd tore apart the trust between her cops and the communities they serve. If this is a broken relationship, how do I go into your home when the homicide has been committed as a police officer wearing the uniform? During Hall's time, murders spiked in Dallas, as they did across the country. But according to numbers from the Dallas Police Department, her detectives solved more than 70 percent of homicides. That's 20 points higher than the national average. One of the first things my team and I did, we met, and I told them I only want to go mm. to those communities where our relationships are challenged. I started there. We showed Hall a press conference she held in 2020. Not only are we broken hearted, we are angry. After gunfire killed a one-year-old named Rory Norman in his own bedroom. What's that about for you? I'd gone to the hospital and saw his body. It's very small body. And this has to stop in this city. Two years later, there's still been no arrest made in the murder of Rory Norman. How can that be? You know, if I had that answer, I'd be rich. And so what are we going to do about it at this point? It takes work and it takes owning where we are flawed fixing it. Jim Axelrod, CBS News, New York. So heartbreaking for the families who are involved. And we talked about it earlier, having to wait for so long for answers. It's just a rock and a hard place. It is. And um, you can feel it and you can see mm -hmm. it. The guys and the ladies that wore the uniforms that have to go to those scenes and then um, live with it. Uh, for years not solving the problem or not solving the case. Um, again, it's devastating. Having been both on both sides of it, uh, I still live with cases. I still live with uh, people that um, uh, I take care of the families or, uh, you know, make sure I stay in contact with them that have lost loved ones. It's not something that, um, again, you're not doing this for money. You're not doing this for uh, anything other than public service and um, I it just it comes to 100 percent the government has to step in for the resources of infrastructure to make sure the prosecutor's office and to make sure the police department has bodies they have technology right but they need to have the bodies and they need to have the institutional knowledge and the pride to make sure that they can build up that community and um, there's plenty of great stories out there and uh, I believe wholeheartedly there's great prosecutors and great defense attorneys and, and excellent cops. Uh, but without resources, it's going to be a lopsided game in this world we live in. There's well, and in that, in, oh, I'm sorry, Jeff, but in that in particular, they discussed um, for victims of color. You know, have you mm. noticed any uh, of that? You know, is that a fair? statement yeah. to make that it that it appears that more black and brown people are are suffering or not having their cases without a question or, without okay. a question that's a no-brainer mm -hmm. uh, yeah and and uh, solving that issue and solving the the divide in a lot of ways uh, needs to again uh, we need to have better education better training and the like uh, it's sad but you without question will see the, the problems of race come into every equation uh, as it relates to, to crime within the city and unsolved problems within the city. Um, and that has to evolve and that has to get better and we have to progress and evolve yeah. as human beings uh, to make this a better place. And obviously we're dealing with two issues here. We have a backlog in the system and all, obviously we have just crimes that are still being committed. Okay, well, I guess my question is, because Renee used to work, Renee used to work for me, she was my deputy chief, and they had a high clearance rate there. I want to know on that clearance rate, how many of those are domestic? Because domestics are pretty easy to, to clear. I'm upset with you, you're upset with me, bang, I shoot you, whatever, stabbing, whatever. These ones are the kids, and these are hard. Those are idiots driving down the street as a rule, firing at the wrong house, 
or the right house, my goal when I was on the job, people thought I was crazy. You know what my goal is? I said, I said what? I said, to have kids sleep in beds. And they go, what do you mean? I said, a bed. They don't get it. And I said, they sleep on mattresses now because it's below the window level. Mm-hmm. Stray bullet comes in, they can't hit the kid. Mm-hmm. You're in a bed. Yeah. And that's the problem. A lot of these unsolved are drive-bys. People know who did it. Right. They're going to handle it themselves. Like the old Italian, uh, Sicilian Omerta, right? Mm. We'll handle it ourselves. We don't need the police. And it happens in southwest Detroit because uh, a lot of the uh, Hispanic population, they don't trust the police. Mm-hmm. I get it. I mean, up in the uh, northern suburbs, the uh, Eastern Europeans, I don't trust the police. Yeah. Handle everything yeah. themselves. But as a parent, do you have to understand where they're coming from? You know? Totally. Yeah. I, I can't imagine losing my yeah. child. And I believe me, when they're talking about the cases that stick with you forever, yeah, right, right. I've got them. Yeah. And, and I've seen the kids and been in the morgue, because you have to go to the and you go to the morgue and you know, have to, when they do the autopsy, and you're sitting there going, how the hell can people do this? How can a sane person do this to a little kid? Whether it's right. child abuse or, 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 which I think is yeah. horrendous. Right. Yeah. I, we haven't even scratched the surface, oh. but the domestic violence you won, and the second biggest issue that we find in the courts is the mental illness. Oh, yeah. We haven't even touched or we scratched how yet. many crimes are committed and what are we doing to bring some sort of normalcy to treatment. We have closed down our treatment centers. We have yeah. closed down the Lafayette oh. Center, right? we have more crimes being committed in that genre as we do in domestic violence. So well, We have poor projects for everything else except yeah. mental hospitals. There you go. Yep, and there seems like they're getting younger and younger. Stay with us. We are going to be right back. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Macomb County. Hi, we're CBS News Detroit, but we don't just cover the news here. We're also here, here, and everywhere in between. You know, the places you live, work, and play in Southeast Michigan. We're talking less of this and more of the stories that actually matter to you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock. That's right, local news just found a home in your neighborhood. We're CBS News Detroit, live, streaming, and on demand. Nice to meet you. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Wayne County. Detroit on your block around the clock in Monroe County. CBS News Detroit, the stories you care about. Live, streaming, and on demand. We're on your block around the clock. Southeast Michigan News whenever you want it. We live here. We work here. From North Branch to Southgate. East Point to Westland. Wherever you live, we're here for you. Making a difference in your neighborhood. CBS News Detroit. Live, streaming, and on demand. Building a better newscast, one story at a time. CBS News Detroit, on your block, around the clock in Oakland County. Are you ready? How would you build the newscast of the future? Expect the unexpected. CBS News Detroit. CBS News Detroit. Southeast Michigan News whenever you want it. We're ready to go live from your community. Anywhere, anytime. Live streaming and on demand. If that's the name of the game, we are ready. CBS News Detroit, in your neighborhood. Live streaming and on demand. Welcome back. One of the things we were talking about in the break was the new technology shot spotter to detect gunfire location and alert police. But you think that it's potentially, it sounds great on paper, but it can be an issue. It can be an issue if you don't have the proper manpower. If 
you guys are dispatched to a homicide and a couple units, never just one, three or four units go there and then another shot spotter comes out, how do you get someone to respond to that? It's a good idea. It tells you the caliber of the weapon. It's good, but like Todd said earlier, the green light is even better. And you can talk about another, because that's all video, and, and that's a great idea. And what yeah. is that? What is green light? So one of the things that DPD has uh, within their headquarters, they have a whole room, a whole section of cameras that are on intersections and now on highways, right? And we can see in real time, real time, the crimes that are going down. So you have a dispatcher call in, you have a green light, which has a camera zone. Um, uh, the fact that they have that technology and the fact that they have it live, mm -hmm. right? You're there to solve crimes immediately, especially that with guns. What's the issue? The issue is, again, manpower and resources. But uh, Detroit has today, I think, you know, one of the best technology centers Absolutely. around in our country as it relates to what's implemented. Um, and I think ultimately you'll find as we build up and get our cases down, you'll see the police department standing proud and, and I, I salute them for so many great things they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously it's a tough issue and hopefully we can resolve some of this as Detroit is one of the most dangerous cities in the entire country and hopefully we can get those rates down like the rest right. of the country we of course have seen. Well, Todd, Steve, thank you so much for joining thank us you. tonight and thanks for watching the special edition of CBS News Detroit at 7 o'clock. We will see you a little bit later for CBS News Detroit at 11. Have a good night.